Welcome to episode 405 of Hot Media with Bob Mann. Every week on this podcast, we talk about the hottest controversies and the hottest content in the media. And we're trying something new on this episode. It's going to be a monologue. I've done these in the past. But I'm looking at the top five TV moments of the week. September, October, they used to mean a lot in television because that was the beginning of the so-called new season. There were only three networks, the big broadcasters, CBS, NBC, and ABC. And I remember as a little kid going for the TV guide and being so excited. I could read about all the new shows and my favorite shows from the previous season that were coming back. Well, that has pretty much gone away, although there still are TV seasons for shows like Saturday Night Live and The Simpsons and even 60 Minutes. So I thought that at least for this week, I would look at the top five TV moments of the week of the last uh, days of September going into the first days of October. And it's an interesting mix because it reflects a lot of what this show actually does. And um, some of what I have here is sports related. Most of it is comedy satire, but some of it, as a matter of fact, what I'm starting off with at number five is straight up news. And that's what we're going to be starting off with. Moment number five uh, was just a week ago as I record this podcast on the Sunday for a Monday uh, publishing. It's going to be published on Monday, October 3rd. It's Scott Pelley of 60 Minutes on the second episode of the new season of 60 Minutes, season number 55, and his interview with Anthony Blinken, who, of course, is the Secretary of State. A lot of bold questions and bold answers. 60 Minutes deserves a lot of credit. It finds its roots in Don Hewitt, whose roots uh, were with Edward R. Murrow. And so they really take a tough stance on everything. And while they have revealed all the wrongdoings of Donald Trump and his supporters, they were also pointing out many of the misstatements of President Biden in the recent weeks when it comes to international affairs. But when Vladimir Putin says that his nuclear war threat in Ukraine is not a bluff, Antony Blinken, who handles foreign policy for us, for the United States of America, says that he is definitely not bluffing. And he talks about the war in Ukraine and what it would take to stop it. And he says, well, if Vladimir Putin wants to stop the war, he should just stop the war because it's his war. It's his campaign. And he had this exact quote, if Russia stops fighting, the war ends. If Ukraine stops fighting, Ukraine ends. Very powerful. And remember, 60 Minutes is not just giving you that two-minute report called the ENG package that uh, most TV news gives you. It is uh, a TV news magazine show by its very nature, 13, 14-minute pieces. So you can have a lot of background material. But one of the other things that uh, Pelle went on to ask uh, Blinken is, is there anyone in the Kremlin who can actually tell Vladimir Putin no? And again, it was a great quote from Blinken. In any autocracy, actually, I believe he said it's the Achilles heel of an autocracy, there is usually not anyone who has the capacity or the will to actually speak the truth to power. And that's very scary. Now, I told you that they take on just about anyone, and uh, they did have some clips from the interview the previous week with President Biden. And President Biden said the administration has a plan. Well, Pelley took a chance and he asked if there is a plan which does not create World War III. And of course, Blinken said, listen, we can't tell you what the plan is, but we do have a plan. There was a dramatic moment, and I don't believe that 60 Minutes is the type of show that would stage something. A text came in to Pelle on his phone during the course of the interview with Blinken, and the text had said that the UN has discovered that there are war, cram war crimes, serious crimes, including against children being committed by Russia in Ukraine. Uh, and then he also went on, though, to go back to another subject and talk about President Biden and a possible misstatement that the president may have made during the previous week's episodes interview of 
Pelley with President Biden, in which the president seemed to indicate that we would have a different policy toward Taiwan and would actually defend Taiwan should communist China attack it. And Pelley was very direct with the question. Blinken didn't dodge it, but he also said that he spoke with the Chinese foreign minister. And while he couldn't go into too many details, because let's face it, there is the balance of national security versus the public's right to know, he handled it, I thought, very well. One of the great moments of the past week in television. Now let's move to sports. And of course, for any New York Yankee fan like myself, we are obsessed with Aaron Judge chasing these home run records. I was lucky enough to be there with my wife when he hit number 60 to tie Babe Ruth. It was on television from Toronto that he hit number 61 to try to, not just to try to, but to achieve tying Roger Maris for the Yankee record and the American League record, and for what many people think is still the only legitimate home run record, although we won't go into that on this particular show. We can save that for WFAN Sports Talk. But what I want to talk about is Michael Kay's, phone, uh, Michael Kay's call on the television and a reaction to it by someone uh, who is not one of my favorites. So here it is verbatim, what Kay actually said. And, you know, he could have done anything um, when he did number 60. As I said, I was at the game, but I saw it later on my app. And he said, um, slide over, babe, meaning Babe Ruth, you have room at number 60. So I was wondering what he was going to do for 61, which was uh, actually bigger. So here's what Kay said verbatim. He's done it. Number 61, he was chasing history, and now he makes it. Pretty good. I mean, obviously, he had to have it ready. There had been so many games and so many at-bats in which Judge didn't get one of the home runs that was expected. It's not easy to just dial up a home run. That's what his manager, Aaron Boone, keeps saying in the press conferences. But um, even though what Kay had said was... um, you know, pretty much rehearsed by him. It's still pretty good. But Kurt Schilling, actually, Kurt Schilling is a former baseball star. There's no doubt he is uh, was a star. And uh, he has done some broadcasting, and he's also done some very radical uh, political talk uh, in his day, uh, in his retirement. And he said that Michael Kay should have just kept his mouth shut. That because it's television and not radio, let the public see and hear exactly what's happening and let them take it in. But it's just interesting that uh, someone who a lot of people would wish would shut his mouth, Kurt Schilling, would say that Michael Kay should shut his mouth on what was a great call. Now, to keep Schilling out of it, uh, let's just talk, though, a little bit about radio versus television when it comes to sports play-by-play. Red Barber was the great announcer for the Brooklyn Dodgers and then for the Yankees. Um, Ben Scully was with the Dodgers, of course, all those years in both Brooklyn and Los Angeles, but Red Barber was very much synonymous with the Brooklyn Dodgers, finished up uh, with the Yankees. And somebody once asked him, because in those days, the broadcasters, at least for the Yankees, would go back and forth between radio and TV, And they said, which do you prefer, radio or television? He said, radio. Because on television, they actually don't need me. On radio, I am the game. Without me, they have no game. And that's a very interesting point that I do share with uh, sports media students uh, at my university. Number three, John Oliver, who, of course, keeps winning Emmys all the time. Uh, But I guess he deserves it because it's very hard, and I've said this on the podcast, for anybody to actually be able to do a show that is real journalism and real comedy at the exact same time. And he did a wonderful piece, a scathing look just ahead of the Brazilian elections at the current Brazilian dictator, who, of course, wants to stay in power at all costs. And that is, uh, let me pronounce it correctly, uh, Jaya Bolsonaro. And Oliver gave a summary of Bolsonaro's brutal presidency that was worthy of 60 Minutes doing serious journalism, but he was still 
very funny because he quoted Bolsonaro with one thing, saying that he is going to, if he loses, create a tropical riot. And uh, Oliver said (laughs) that tropical riot sounds like a bad Mountain Dew flavor. It is amazing that he can pull off both things at exactly the same time. Of course, it was very important this week that Trevor Noah announced that he's leaving The Daily Show of his own volition. I guess he has a lot more opportunity out there. But Trevor Noah brilliantly, Michael K, Michael uh, Che, and um, Colin Jost brilliantly, uh, Stephen Colbert brilliantly are satirizing the news in what looks like a news program. But John Oliver actually gives you the news with some investigative journalism, but makes it hysterical at the same time. Speaking of Che and Jost, number two, SNL season premiere number 48. Now, a lot of people are figuring Saturday Night Live, 48 seasons, maybe it's going on too long. Well, the first target of their satire in season number 48, the uh, fall 22 through spring 23 season, was Saturday Night Live. They went after themselves. The cast changes, some of the recurring bits, some of the efforts by new performers to come on and to make a name for themselves. And uh, they did it uh, using a spoof of the Manning cast. If you're not a sports fan, you may not know what a Manning cast is. And it's now also moved into baseball with something called the K-Rod cast. Two people, famous people, sports figures or sports broadcasters will sit and just watch a game. They'll talk about the game, the games on ESPN, then, you know, the game um, they're talking about it is on ESPN too. And they'll show you the game. They'll talk about the game like two fans sitting at home and also invite in guests. It's become a very popular format in sports broadcasting. And so Miles Teller <laughs> played the part of Peyton Manning and uh, Andrew Dismukes played the part of his brother, Eli Manning. And they started to mock their own show. It's like, oh, great. Something really topical. Another Trump sketch. And in a wipe, another block of the screen was uh, James Austin Johnson, who just does a perfect Trump and a perfect Biden. And they were doing a Trump sketch. But they made it intentionally lame and obvious. It was about hiding documents at Mar-a-Lago. And he goes, look at this. Look how trite this is. And this is back from the summer. And there's a million things that could be going on. Oh, and look at Bo and Yang. He's coming back and he's trying to have a catchphrase. Oh, there's the new kid, the rookie. He's phrasing. He's, he's scared to death. He's frozen on the camera. It really was just brilliant. And it just shows the self-awareness of Saturday Night Live. Now, I think Miles Teller is somebody who's definitely going to be a star. He was on as the first host of the season because he was the co-star of Top Gun Maverick over the course of the summer, the hottest blockbuster out there. Actually brought me back into a movie theater after the COVID pandemic. The last movie I'd seen before that was uh, 1917. And he, But where people didn't see him was something that I had loved, which was on Paramount Plus called The Offer. It was a 10-part limited series about the making of The Godfather. Now, I love The Godfather, and maybe that's why I love this so much. I love behind the scenes in media. It got tepid reviews, but you could just see Teller, who was playing producer Al Ruddy and all of what Ruddy really went through in real life to get this movie made. And and you could just see that Teller was definitely going to be a star, and he certainly has comic ability as well. But number one, and boy, does it deserve it for this week. Number one. The Simpsons season 34 premiere. Can you imagine? I'm talking about one show that has a season 48 premiere and another with a season 34. Now, this skewered conspiracy theorists. They didn't actually come out and say QAnon or anything of that nature. But the writers selected the most pathetic recurring characters to join in Homer Simpson's social media group. They claimed with no evidence that a beloved tortoise at the zoo had been kidnapped by the very honest and very upstanding zoo director. The group included Gil. Gil is the poor soul, the tough luck loser who can never hold a job. Miss Hoover, who has been portrayed for 34 years as the worst teacher in Springfield Elementary, she's Lisa's teacher. Comic book guy who thinks 
he is very smart. He thinks he's a pompous intellectual, but all he is is pompous. Sideshow Mel, who is second banana to a show business hack, uh, Krusty the Clown, boxer Dredrick Tatum, uh, who uh, is now voiced by Jay Farrow, formerly of Saturday Night Live, and the very angry and uh, not too successful school superintendent, Chalmers. And, of course, Chief Wiggum, possibly the worst police officer in America, at least the worst chief. Well, Homer finds validation in this group. He says he finally found a group of anonymous cyber sleuths who don't think I'm dumb. And the turtle is found. The turtle is found in Homer's house. Homer found the turtle, but he couldn't give it up. And even when he finally gave up the truth, the group would not accept the results. And Marge says, Homer, you have to go with the truth. And Homer says, well, in this day and age of social media, the truth is something different. It's more of a hunch that you're willing to die for. I mean, so many people write off The Simpsons as a cartoon and think about Bart saying I Caramba back in 1990. It's so much more. It's one of the best social satires that is out there. And, um, you know, it, it just shows that it still has so much going for it um, because of the fact that, um, well, you know, it, there's still so much to satirize, but they're still sharp. Obviously, the writers uh, change, the producers change over the years, but they always have a group of people who create the same level of greatness. And um, I hope that it never goes off as long as it stays this strong. I'd love to hear what you think about what's top in TV now. And please write to me. Uh, just email me. Uh, those of you who are watching the video version of this, it's up on the screen. Profman53, P-R-O-F-M-A-N-N-5-3 at gmail.com. And of course, I ask you to uh, follow me uh, on Twitter. My handle is at Bob Media, uh, Bobman Media. For those of you just listening to the audio version of the podcast, that is uh, with two N's, B-O-B-M-A-N-N Media. And go to the website www.bobmanhotmedia.com to uh, find out more about this podcast. We're with you every week. We now publish on Mondays. Uh, for the most part, this is done in an interview format, but I do the occasional monologue. And um, we uh, are primarily an audio podcast, but we do a video version on YouTube. In either case, we ask you to please listen, to watch, and above all, to subscribe. And I thank you very much uh, for listening to me go on and realize that uh, even though Newton Minow, the one-time chairman of the Federal Communications Commission, called television a vast wasteland, there's still an awful lot of absolutely wonderful things to watch. And thank you always uh, for joining me here for Hot Media.